did you guys know that before the discovery of insulin was made, type 1 diabetics were actually treated with water from a bird pond. They were treated with milk, they were treated with cucumber flour, and also with beer. So we know now that none of those actually help cure or treat type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And then insulin came along and that kind of changed the whole pathway of the management of type 1 diabetes and type 2. Prior to that, unfortunately, all type 1 diabetics who still to this day need insulin for survival were died because they had no way to manage these patients. However, insulin was discovered, so that kind of changed the whole game plan. But after that, then we started anti-diabetic oral medications that we use to this day. So guys, welcome back to the Voice of Diabetes. This is Diana Bitucci, and if you're wondering what class of medications I'm gonna to discuss today, it's gonna to be sulfonylureas. What is that? Well, sulfonylureas actually were discovered in the 1950s when they found this, uh, this agent that was actually causing the low blood sugar levels, and they said, hey, this is great. We can use this for type two diabetics because we know that the type two diabetics have uh, high blood sugar levels. So this causes low blood sugar levels. Why don't we use this and bring blood sugars down? So over the years, we had numerous, numerous of different sulfonylureas, but right now, believe it or not, a lot of those has faded out and we are left with glimipiride, glipizide, and gliburide as the three mostly used sulfonylureas today. And I use them myself in the endocrinology specialty. As a warning sign, I do not use sulfonylureas with type 1 diabetes because to date, the only way to manage type 1 diabetes that is FDA approved approved by the American Diabetes Association is insulin. So if you're reading any other, any other sources that tell you otherwise, such as curing type 1 diabetes or herbs, I highly, highly encourage you to discuss that with your uh, provider because that can be extremely fatal for, for type 1 diabetes. These oral anti-diabetics, especially this particular class, we use for type 2 diabetes. As you may know, metformin is, is a first line uh, anti-diabetic oral agent that we use and it happens to be one of my personal favorite, of course, and that is also backed up by the American Diabetes Association, the ADA, a very reliable source that we use in endocrinology every day. However, I do have a video on metformin, so if you are on metformin or you would like to learn what metformin is, since it is the first line medication we use for a patient who's developed, uh, either we use it in pre-diabetes, we use it in diabetes, but we also use it in different cases like PCOS. So make sure you guys check out my video on metformin. I will link it at the end of the video. After metformin use, a lot of different providers actually rely on sulfonylureas as a second line. And if a patient cannot tolerate metformin, they usually go to sulfonylurea as a second choice to use it for that patient. So why are we commonly using this medication? Well, it's been around for a very long time and it's inexpensive and it's, it's generic. So those are all things that we consider when we're managing patients. So sulfonylureas actually work, and what they do is they tell your pancreas, make more insulin. So we know one of the defective things in type 2 diabetes is that the pancreas or the beta cells of the pancreas are not producing enough insulin, therefore causing higher blood sugar levels in the bloodstream. We know that this is a defect in type 2 diabetes. So what sulfonylureas do is they, they tell the pancreas, hey, you need to make more insulin because I don't have enough. That's great because what we're doing is we are talking directly to the pancreas and we are telling the pancreas, hey, you are not making enough of insulin, so wake up and work harder. Believe it or not, sulfonylureas actually reduce A1C. A1C is even more than metformin does and other medications that we have. It reduces it almost by 2%. So let's just say you are that, uh, that patient tuning in today and your A1C is 8% it can actually drop you down to about 6.5 or 6% just with the use of sulfonylureas. So if this class of medication is so great, then why are we not using this class of medication as much as we should? And why is it that the ADA guidelines are actually uh, recommending sulfonylureas last? So they, they recommend a metformin first, and then of course we have GLP-1 analogs now, which are newer medications that actually help with weight loss 
and also uh, help reduce A1Cs. And then we have SGLT2 inhibitors like Jardians or Invulcana. And we know that those class of medications are much more expensive than sulfonylureas are. But why is it that we're not all just automatically prescribing sulfonylureas? I do have patients on sulfonylureas. It's my least favorite class of medications. And I've gotten a lot of emails and actually phone calls at work with patients who are watching my videos asking, well, what do you mean you don't like this, you don't like this class and why am I on it? So I don't particularly like this class of medications because remember I said it really punches on the pancreas and tells the beta cells make more insulin. Whenever we are prescribing a medication that does that, we know that we are always risking the chance of going too low. The blood that it releases too much insulin at an unknown amount of time and therefore causing what we call hypoglycemia. And for anyone that's ever experienced hypoglycemia, we know how terrible hypoglycemia is and how dangerous it can be. Another reason why I don't like this medication uh, amongst others and why it is not favored by the American Diabetes Association, well, they cause weight gain. Whenever we're talking about diabetes, even non-diabetes, anything that we hear that causes weight gain, most of us are like, push me away from that because I don't want to gain any more weight. But when we're talking about type 2 diabetes, we know that many type 2 diabetics already struggle with weight. Therefore, adding more weight only further complicates diabetes because the more weight we gain, the more insulin our body needs to produce. And we know that another defect is that our pancreas cannot produce enough insulin. So it just causes a chain reaction where our weight goes up, our blood sugars go up, and we need to continuously add more and more medications to try to bring the blood sugars into more normal value. Another reason why I don't like this class of medications in particular is because remember I mentioned that it punches on the pancreas to say make more insulin, make more insulin. Well, just you're overdriving the pancreas, so you're making the pancreas work extra hard, extra hard. Eventually the pancreas says, you know what, I'm done, I can't produce any insulin. So actually studies show that introducing sulfonylureas very, very early on in the, in the diagnosis of diabetes actually makes the pancreas shut off quicker. So let's just say, um, you know, you were diagnosed one year ago and you've been on a sulfonylurea without trying the newer medications first what it could do is that it shows that those patients who are introduced to sulfonylureas very early on may require insulin much sooner than they would than they would if they had not been in a sulfonylurea. And of course, remember, if I have a patient with liver disease, if I have a patient with kidney disease, sulfonylureas are usually a no-go for me. After age 50 or 60, I normally discontinue sulfonylureas. But why do we still use them is the question. Well, remember, all we have to consider a lot of different things when we're treating patients. One is that sometimes patients cannot tolerate anything else. They might not tolerate metformin. They might not be able to afford the newer medications, and we know that cost is always an issue. So if the patient can only get this medication, obviously we're going to treat with sulfonylureas rather than, than not treating them at all because we know that getting the diabetes or the blood sugars under control is the key factor and that's the outcome we want because we want to prevent organ damage so just kidney disease eye disease heart attacks stroke amputations and so much more which i will talk about in the upcoming videos so do i have patients on sulfonylureas absolutely but i try to avoid at all costs if i can utilize the better med medications like metformin and glp1 analogs which i have videos on both of those class of medications but also SGLT2 inhibitors and many more other classes that I'm going to talk about. But yes, yeah, so sulfonylureas, although we use them, if I can choose between the newer class of medication, I'm always going to choose the newer class of medications because those work much better and they don't have all of these side effects that I talked about, such as the hypoglycemia or the weight gain, which we always um, try to avoid whenever we can. So guys, if you are that patient on a sulfonylurea, I'm not asking you to call your provider and say, hey, why the heck am I taking this? Because there may be a very good reason why you are on it and I have patients. And I discuss this with my patients all the time. I say, oh, you know, this is not my favorite class of medication, but unfortunately, this is the best option for you at this time. And you know, patients understand, and I usually have patients check their blood sugars more regularly if they are on a sulfonylurea versus metformin. Um, just because of the fear that they can go low. And I always discuss the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia so they are aware. 
if they were to have that kind of reaction. I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you have any questions on glimepiride, gliburide, or uh, glipizide, please comment below and share your stories with me. I would love to hear them. And uh, please just make sure you guys are understanding that yes, we still use this class of medications, but when, when it can be avoided, we really try to use this as the last resort. And um, also just for educational purposes, sometimes I will use sulfonylureas actually as first line if I have a patient who's on chemotherapy or if they've gotten like a steroid injections for their shoulder or their knee, I will use this for a few days because we know that their blood sugars tend to run much higher after steroid use. So I'll use it for about three days just, you know, um, just so we can keep their blood sugars at bay. Um, and then of course we discontinue it. So sometimes I will use it for a very short period of time for someone who is undergoing chemotherapy or getting some type of steroid treatment um, just because you know their blood sugars tend to run much higher for a few days afterwards and a day of. So I use it short term and then I tell them you no longer need this. We just used it for those three, four days so that they, their blood sugars will not spike out of control. Um, so that's something that I do and a lot of endocrinologists do that. Um, but again, you always wanna consult with your doctor and your provider to see what is the best option for you. I will see you guys all next time. Take care.